Uh, I am a registered landscape architect and did practice uh, doing a lot of campus design, parks and rec, projects like that, as well as some stormwater projects uh, on the landscape side of it. So I do have some familiarity with uh, stormwater engineering. Uh, some learning objectives today. We're going to try to uh, explain a lot of these different things to you, but we want you to really be able to identify uh, the benefits and opportunities for using not only permeable pavers, but porous pavements as well. Uh, they're very similar. Uh, you want to be able to analyze the goals and criteria for using a parental paper system. Uh, you should be able to list the different materials uh, that are used in a parental pavement system after seeing this presentation, and be able to evaluate and compare those different, uh, you know, permeable systems to a traditional stormwater system. And so, when you get done, you should hopefully be able to understand the differences for installing uh, the installing procedures for parental pavement versus other types of systems uh, and how they go into place. The agenda, we'll, we'll start off with just some general introductions to permeable interlocking concrete pavers. We'll look at a few case studies around mostly Chicago land area. Uh, I'm based out of Chicago, so a lot of the uh, projects we've worked on that have really grown over the last uh, uh, five, ten years uh, are really in the Chicago land area. Uh, we'll take a look at the different uh, benefits and systematic solutions for using permeable interlocking concrete pavers. And then we'll start to talk about the design considerations, the uh, solutions, opportunities, and the different components and materials that are in uh, a permeable system so you guys understand uh, you know, which materials to call out, which ones are going to work and not work. And if we have time, I'll give you a quick commercial on uh, Unilock so you get a better background on yourself. Conceptually speaking, uh, hopefully most people kind of understand what parental pavement is. The idea is that you have uh, rainwater coming down, landing on the, the surface of the pavement, and there's gaps in between the paver units or in a, a porous system where it has openings that allow water to flow through and get back down into the ground, providing moisture and oxygen for, for plant material. Um, a lot of times, uh, people use pernal pavement because that stone layer underneath the pavers can be used for detention. So they can store a certain amount of water there for a period of time and allow it to naturally infiltrate back into the ground. And again, it depends on what kind of soil conditions you have, whether you're going to need uh, additional systems or not. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. In terms of uh, you know, concrete pavers and that wearing course that the, the water will flow through, I put a photo here of uh, someone's backyard. And this is a, a, just a, a regular patio. They actually have a dragon cut into their patio. It's kind of a unique uh, design here. This is a non permeable uh, system. And this is, I think, a lot of times people think of pavers um, you know, for things like this, uh, um, you know, not necessarily a structural uh, stormwater type system. So I think the nice thing about pavers is that they give you a lot of design flexibility in terms of using different colors and textures. In this case, there's a, a tumbled paver for the field. There's a, a black paver that kind of has the uh, outline of the dragon that has an exposed granite surface. And then the belly of the dragon towards the bottom there in the center is green. And that's a split paver to kind of give it a rough, rough texture. Uh, so by doing those different things, you can create very interesting designs. But uh, what people don't know usually is that concrete pavers are actually designed for heavy-duty applications. So all over the world, they're used in uh, you know very heavy-duty uh, type uh, areas, industrial areas, uh, a lot of uh, uh, ports like the the. The photo on the left here is of a forklift uh, picking up some steel coils at the um, Port of Tampa. Um, the Port of New Orleans, the Port of Oakland all have pavers in their container yards where they drive semis around in a circle continuously loading and, and offloading uh, ships. Uh, and that's because they can withstand that heavy point loading of trucks and vehicles. Uh, we'll talk more about the strengths of the pavers. Uh, later, but uh, you know it's the whole system. When they looked at uh, the Port of Tampa Bay, they did a 20-year life cycle study on that, and they found that uh, concrete pavers 
were about half as much as asphalt over a 20-year life cycle. Um, just the less wear and tear, uh, less expensive to put in, and, and so uh, not less expensive to put in, but less expensive over that 20-year period. Uh, so you can have some savings there. Now these are non-permeable photos, but certainly we'll talk about permeable and how that plays into effect in, in terms of heavy duty. Uh, but just wanted to kind of show or illustrate that you know they can withstand those heavy point loadings. Uh, the largest uh, installation in the U.S. is the Port of Oakland with about 2 million square feet of pavers. The largest uh, container yard in the world is actually the Hong Kong airport, which has about 2 million square meters of uh, concrete pavers. So when we start to talk about prairial pavement, uh, this is a photo in downtown Chicago called Couch Place. It's an alleyway that links the theater district. And so they wanted this to be a functional alleyway as well as a decorative so that they could link the theater district from the Goodman to the Chicago Theater, which is on State Street, and have this corridor that people could walk through and it wouldn't look so like an alley. Uh, so not only is it aesthetic, it's heavy duty in that they can drive trucks in here to unload uh, for the different theaters, and they can also have garbage pick up uh, without you know, a lot of damage to the surface. Um, and it's functional in that it allows water to flow to the surface and get back down into the, the base area. And hopefully most of this will uh, infiltrate into the natural soils beneath the, uh, the pavement. Uh, so when we start to look at uh, you know, more aesthetic type projects, this is a project on the East Coast called Stonehill College. And it is um, a giant quadrilateral area. Um, that is kind of a, a four season activity area. They didn't want this space to be uh, just used in the summertime. They didn't want to have a bunch of uh, stormwater you know, inlets out here. So they created this uh, permeable system that's not only functional, but it's decorative as well. So they can have, uh, you can see these uh, knockout areas, the silver areas, those pop out and they can mount a uh, tent structure there so they can create a, a room in the winter time. So you know, utilizing concrete pavers or permeable concrete pavers doesn't mean you have to sacrifice the design intent or the project integrity. So you can still have those creative designs by using uh, concrete pavers and still have it be functional uh, to capture that stormwater or rainwater. Uh, this project is called um, uh, Green Hills Public Library. It's down in Palos Hills. And I think it shows a, a great example of how they've taken a an asphalt parking lot that was in relatively good condition and transformed it into a stormwater uh, system by installing perennial pavement. So this entire lot is all uh, perennial pavers. And it actually has, uh, uh, in the lower uh, side of this parking lot, has a underground uh, catch area with a, a pond liner, it's a rotorized pond liner. And they actually recirculate some of this water for the plant material and uh, use it for irrigation. So not only is it uh, a transformation in terms of you know, how it uh, captures that stormwater and stores it, but it also has high reflectivity, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Uh, in this case, going from a black asphalt to a, a gray concrete can actually decrease the pavement temperature by about uh, 15, 20 degrees. Uh, so it can make a big difference in how that space feels in the summertime when there's a lot of heat. Uh, we'll take a look at a couple of case studies here. Back uh, a few years ago in the fall of uh, 2007, they installed a U.S. cellular field lot L. At that time, it was the largest uh, permeable lot in the country. Uh, Buckhand Fountain is still probably the largest uh, decorative plaza with permeable pavement. That was installed about a year later in 2000, fall of 2008. And then Governor State has some interesting cost uh, uh, analysis here with this that we'll talk about. So with uh, U.S. Cellular Field, it's a lot further to the south. Uh, it was about 265,000 uh, square feet when they installed it. And originally in 2007, they hadn't implemented the new stormwater uh, guidelines for the city of Chicago. So the uh, engineering company looked at it in a very traditional way of having uh, a grid work of, of inlets and uh, a pipe and a storage tank to capture the water and store it. 
on site before it's released into the uh, system. It would have had uh, 44 inlets or catch basins, over 3,000 linear feet of reinforced concrete pipe, and a storage tank of about 73,000 cubic feet uh, to hold that water before it's released back into the municipal system. With the uh, new stormwater guidelines back in 2008, um, they you know saw that all this infrastructure is going to be about 2,000 or 2 million dollars. They thought with the new guidelines come in place, they might be able to use perennial pavement. So they took a look at that option and found out that they had a, a 14 inch an hour of infiltration in the subgrid. They had very sandy soils here, so a lot of the water would infiltrate quickly. That enabled them to eliminate the inlets. Uh, there is no reinforced concrete pipe underneath there. Uh, they eliminate the storage tank, which accounted for about 15% savings versus that traditional design with the uh, bituminous asphalt surface, inlet, uh, uh, underground storage tank. So there's quite a bit of savings there. Uh, they also designed this with two colors. So they have a, uh, let me go back up here. They have a, a light color and a dark color to kind of design uh, where the parking stalls were versus the drive aisles. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the base later on, the materials. But the section for the pavement there in the parking lot is about 14 inches. So you did some quick little math there, uh, 265,000 square feet of paving with about a 14-inch uh, base aggregate. And the void space is about 40% in the base. They had over 123,000 cubic feet of storage. They were only required about 73,000. So they actually had a surplus on site of about 50,000 cubic feet of storage capacity. So they could have drained on, you know, if there's a building nearby, they could have drained some of that water into that perennial base area. Uh, here's a photo of it being installed. You can see the U.S. cellular fuel in the background and, and the Sears Tower even further back. Uh, you can see they had charcoal for the parking bays and the granite uh, color on the right there was the, the drive aisles. Uh, we'll show a video later on and how this machine works and how it sets these uh, mechanically, which actually will help speed up installation. We'll talk about that a little bit here uh, later on. Uh, Buckingham, I'm sure everyone's seen this uh, found at some point, uh, either on TV or or actually visited the site. It's pretty amazing. The, the fountain area in the center there is about an acre. Uh, it's quite a big uh, fountain. You don't realize until you get up close to it, but it is uh, pretty ginormous. Uh, back in the fall of 2008, they wanted to redesign this because it had a pea gravel surface. It wasn't very accessible, so they wanted to make it a little bit uh, easier for people to maneuver in wheelchairs. They also have a lot of wedding parties go out there and women in high heels, so they were concerned about uh, trip hazards and things like that. So they embarked on uh, redesigning this plaza space. And originally, it was just going to be a few small areas that were permeable. Uh, after they started working on the project, they decided to design the entire surface, the entire deck, which is about 235,000 square feet with uh, permeable pavers. Uh, they selected a paver that uh, was actually designed in three shapes, uh, all individual shapes that they hand installed. Uh, here's a photo of uh, those three. There's a 10 by 10 square, a 5 by 10 square, and a 5 by 5 uh, square as well. Sorry, 5 by 10 rectangle. Uh, this paper has about a quarter inch wide joint. So it actually has about over 100 inches an hour of infiltration through those joint areas. So it can capture quite a bit of water relatively quickly, uh, but still makes it uh, considered accessible because that joint's not wider than a half inch. So you can still maneuver fairly well with uh, uh, wheelchairs and high heels and things like that. Uh, this is pretty unique because they actually had a hand install that. And this was the entire pattern that they had to repeat out there throughout that site. So the contractor actually uh, memorized this pattern, created a couple templates, and they actually hand installed these one at a time. They, uh, uh, if you look down again at that fountain, they kind of started right around 4 o'clock, you will, if you're looking at a clock. They worked clockwise up to about 11 o'clock and stopped. They actually went back down to 4 o'clock and worked counterclockwise and kind of zipped this up. So the entire project um, doesn't have any expansion joints anywhere around this entire area. It's all um, individual pairs that are kind of, uh, you know, once they put them together, it's kind of a monolithic paving surface. 
but there's no uh, expansion joints out there. Uh, with the low absorption of the pavers, you're not going to have a lot of expansion and contraction, so it's not going to uh, uh, move as much as it would if it was poured in place concrete. Uh, Governor State is kind of a cool project because they actually, again, had real uh, numbers here from the from the design firm when they installed this. They uh, uh, did two designs. Uh, lot B was the first one. They actually had a base bid and then an alternate for some pavers. And uh, after they got the pricing back from that, they went out and bid lot C. But you can kind of see in these photos, especially on the lot to the far right, the wear and tear on the asphalt. Uh, how much it's worn with the cars drive in and out. I'm sure in those areas there's you know cracking and potholes in the asphalt surface. Uh, so when they bid these, uh, if you look at this uh, bid tabs uh, uh, provided by the engineering firm, they actually had a, a base bid of about uh, $992,000. Um, they actually looked at uh, doing an alternate to do all the all the uh, uh, parking lot in pavers. You see the uh, cost per square foot down there, alternate one. Uh, so it's showing the base bit at 993 a square foot, and then showing the uh, alternate at 1117 a square foot. So for about a dollar 24 more a square foot, they um, decided to pick up the uh, the alternate and do the entire parking lot in uh, Perno Pavers. So it was about 124 thousand dollars more. And you look at the life cycle of that, Governor State um, decided that it was less expensive over about seven years than it would be if they put down asphalt. Uh, prevents them from seal coating or having to mill off the surface uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, lot C um, was a little bit more expensive. They did that about a month later. It was a little bit larger, and, and uh, the price of petroleum had dropped a little bit, so asphalt was a little bit less expensive at the time. So it was about $2 uh, a square foot more for the pavers. Uh, they still went through and installed it. So they have about 220,000 square feet at Governor State University. So we'll talk about the system, systematic solution for using parallel pavement. It is considered a structural uh, BMP by the uh, EPA's National Pollutant Discharge and Elimination System, NPDES. Uh, it is, uh, considered to be a, a helps reduce uh, runoff um, during storm events. It can reduce the runoff temperature. You know, instead of water running across that black asphalt and heating up, if you use lighter color materials that are not as hot, the water temperature will stay lower, which is a big deal for, you know, aquatic life. Uh, it can improve the water quality. Again, it's kind of a natural filtration system as the water flows through that uh, granular base material. It's going to pick up uh, contaminants. And then most of the time we see it being used uh, in a lot of these suburban areas in the city of Chicago is for detention reasons. We try to um, almost add extra redundant detention on top of uh, what may already be required. Uh, you know, with some of the changes in our climate, we're seeing there's a lot more flooding than there was, you know, five, ten years ago. Uh, the big question engineers always like to ask is, uh, what is the runoff coefficient using the rational, the, the C value using the rational method? You know, actually it's zero. Uh, you know, if you think about the amount of, uh, the intensity of a storm and the amount of water that the pavers can capture, as long as your base is, has enough capacity and the surface isn't clogged, all the water should flow through the surface of the pavers and not generate any runoff. However, a lot of uh, jurisdictions or agencies uh, you know, have come up with different numbers ranging from 0.25 to 0.35. Uh, again, it just varies. The city of Chicago has uh, two ways to calculate your runoff coefficient depending on how you use it. Uh, and then it just varies from uh, county and uh, municipality. There are uh, many benefits. We'll kind of flip through these in the next few slides here and kind of explain each one and, and what we mean by these. But uh, it can help reduce runoff, uh, service runoff. Uh, can use the water on site. It can decrease pollution from runoff. Uh, we, as we mentioned, reduce uh, detention pond size. And there's some intangibles for using uh, pavers as well. 
Hopefully this video will play for everyone. It's a, a short little clip just to kind of illustrate, you know, by pouring water on the surface, how fast it can infiltrate uh, when you have a concentrated stream here. So you see a lot of splatter outside, but where the water hits the paver, it only has to run, you know, a couple inches in each direction before it actually starts to flow into the joint material area. So it's not draining across the entire surface. If this was a black asphalt or uh, a concrete material uh, that's impervious, you see the water draining away from this or ponding on the surface. So some, some typical uh, infiltration rates off the surface, you know, it will vary by product. Uh, Eco-Opulock Eco -Opulock is tested out at over 200 inches an hour uh, doing field studies. Uh, Eco Priora, which has a half inch wide, or sorry, quarter inch wide joint, uh, has tested out over 100 inches an hour in lab tests. Uh, it would probably uh, test out at that at least in, in the field as well. Uh, the granular flow rates uh, are listed there for IDOT TA16, TA7, and TA1, which we'll talk about here a little bit later. But there is a, a test method now for testing the infiltration off the surface uh, for different types of uh, permeable systems, that's ASTM C1781, and it's a single ring that, that's kind of glued down to the surface of the pavement or put a, a caulker on the outside, and then they pour a certain amount of water into this uh, ring, and they're able to calculate how fast that, that drains into the area. So you can test pavements when they're first installed. You know, you can test them on a yearly basis to kind of see if there's any decrease in infiltration and things like that. Uh, the first one of the first projects in uh, Chicagoland was uh, Dominican University installed in 2003. It uh, was designed to, to contain a 100-year storm. And this has about 200,000 square feet on site. And they had some unique uh, conditions where they started to have more commuter students on campus. They needed more surface parking, except they didn't want to encroach in all their green space. Uh, and when they put down the you know the parking lot areas, they need to have detention for those. So uh, by doing perennial pavement, instead of having two separate areas, one for parking and one for surface detention, they essentially stack these vertically, and the, the detention is underneath the parking lot area. Uh, so they don't have to encroach on all their you know, athletic fields or green spaces to do this. Uh, even smaller projects like the, uh, for example, here the Lincoln Park Zoo, they put in uh, perennial pavement so they didn't choke out the uh, existing trees that were out there. They wanted to make sure that these uh, I think this is a, a honey locust tree out here. Didn't suffocate by the new work they had to do for this entryway. Uh, they put down perennial pavement so those roots will still continue to get moisture and oxygen uh, and, and thrive. We didn't want to suffocate those trees. Compared to you know some big box retail uh, suburban type parking lots where you have a dense pavement, all impervious with uh, you know a five foot tree pit where there just isn't enough moisture that can get back down to those roots. And uh, the roots aren't going to grow underneath that, that pavement because there's no moisture or oxygen underneath there. It just completely gets root bound and eventually the tree will die. So you know, that shows you an example of uh, what not to do. In terms of uh, decreasing pollution from runoff, uh, the studies that have been done by you know different uh, you know, colleges and, and uh, research people have found that uh, most of the contaminants are captured in that top one to two inches where the water flows through. So right underneath where it says automobile oil, uh, or it's kind of pointing to the, the separation, and those are kind of a, a grid pavement. Uh, that top one to two inches is where most of it will be captured. So as the water flows through that granular base material, it's capturing contaminants, oils, metals, things like that. And so when it's discharged at the bottom there or starts to infiltrate into the, the base, that it has a significant decrease of pollution from the water. Uh, there's been, a, as I mentioned, a few studies. This one was by the Interlocking Concrete Pavement Institute. Uh, they looked at some uh, numbers based on uh, you know, uh, uh, infiltration trench design. And the right there says infiltration trenches and porous pavements. That's essentially a perennial pavement parking lot with a, any runoff would have gone into the infiltration trench. But they show that 95% removal of uh, suspended solids, TSS. 
And if you look at the bottom there, metals had a 99% removal rate from the from the water. So it can actually help uh, you know clean the water as it flows through there, almost like a a Brita water filter for the environment, if you will. Uh, reduction in detention pond site. I, I think I kind of covered this a little bit, but again, this is uh, Villa Park Police Station where it was a, actually a lead project. Uh, they needed more parking spaces for municipal vehicles as well as detention. So by using, you know, parental payment again, they're able to stack that so they don't have as much surface detention. Uh, you know, which allows them to make not only a bigger parking lot, but also it could make the building bigger. Uh, if you're working on subdivisions where you need to have, you know, uh, or retail areas where you need to have more uh, uh, larger lot sizes, if you used perennial pavement instead of impervious systems, you know, you could actually add another building there, another, uh, you know, restaurant or larger retail spaces. And the way that it usually, or the way that it does slow down first flush erosion effects is by, when that water flows to the surface there, you can actually put, you know, restrictors into the manholes if you have a, uh, a system where it has infrastructure and slow down that water from flowing back into the municipal system and just almost detain that for a certain amount of time until after the storm and let it, you know, slowly drain out of the, the uh, parking lot. So the idea is that you don't want your post-development runoff to be more than your pre-development. You want to make sure those stay the same so you don't increase that downstream flooding. Uh, one of the things that people always ask is, you know, well, how much water can be stored in, in a, a perennial base? So we put together this quick little chart to show you that uh, how much water can be stored. And if you're looking at um, a, uh, a one-acre lot, uh, if you get one inch of rainfall, the USGS says that uh, one inch of rain over the acre will actually generate about 27,153 gallons of water. And if you look at the storage capacity of that, if you take a, uh, a one acre lot with a 12 inch base, you can actually store about 130,000 gallons of, of water. Um, so you actually have about uh, 100,000 gallons of surplus so with that one inch rainfall in a 12 inch base. So you're only using about 20% of that capacity for a one inch rainfall. It's not until you get down to the larger amounts like the five and seven inch rainfalls where you actually start to max out that capacity uh, in terms of you know starting to have that base completely fill up and start to generate runoff off the surface. So about a five eighths a gallon uh, per square foot per hour uh, is a 5.11 inch rainfall. Uh, any guesses on, uh, well, if you were going to guess, and I could hear you, <laughs> uh, any guesses on what Chicago's monthly average rainfall is? It's probably not as much as everyone thinks. Uh, actually, Chicago gets about 2.9 inches a month, about 35 annually. Uh, you know, most of the, the region, Illinois, is right around that two and a half to three inch rainfall amount uh, per month, um, and it will vary, you know, depending on the month. Like, for example, April, they have 13 inches, but if you look at the average, they're right around 2.9 per month. Uh, recently, the uh, uh, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District uh, here in, the, in Chicago uh, put together a new draft ordinance for that includes perennial pavement. And they put together some 210 and 100 year uh, rainfall event numbers. Uh, so you're looking at the two years, about three inches. The 10 years, almost uh, five inches. And the, the 100 years, about seven and a half inches of rainfall. Uh, if you're looking at like parking lot type uh, designs over a 24 hour period, a 14 inch base would use about 54% for a two year rainfall event, uh, which really isn't as much as you would probably think. You think that would fill up uh, relatively quickly. And two, it, a three-inch rainfall is actually a, a pretty big rainfall event. Um, and if you look at it even larger, like an 18-inch base over a 24-hour period, not having any run on from other areas, uh, you'd only be using about 42% uh, for um, you know, even less. So if, uh, like a 100-year rainfall event, you would have, uh, with an 18-inch base, about 105 uh, percent meaning five percent of the water runoff for about a quarter inch of that uh, seven point five eight inches. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. 
If you look at that again in the chart, this just kind of breaks it down, showing you what those two 10 and 100 year rainfall events looks like with different base conditions ranging from 14 to 22 inches. And on the right, it just shows you the percentages used for that uh, amount. So if you if you have the, uh, the handout in front of you, you can you know, jot those down. Uh, the Center for Neighborhood Technology actually looked at a year's worth of rainfall events and kind of plotted out how much uh, water we get in Chicagoland. Uh, so this is looking at, um, you know, 98% of the storms are two inches or less, uh, which, you know, as we looked at the, the two 10 and 100 rainfall events are all larger than that. So, you know, everything less than that, you know, is the majority of our storms. And 98 percent, and even 95 percent are one inch or less. So the actual amounts we get are not as as great as we might think. Uh, a lot of times they'll say, you know, it came down at in an intensity of five inches an hour, but it only rained for 10 minutes at that rate. So you really don't generate as much water as you might think. Uh, usually we get people to ask about uh, winter data and how that uh, affects perennial pavement. And one of the things that we've noticed over the years is that uh, the base kind of breathes and it stays warmer longer. It takes longer for that base to actually freeze up and then it warms up quicker and that's because there's kind of airflow moving through the, the open graded stone base. Uh, this was uh, some numbers that were uh, generated by the Illinois EPA. They put some probes into the uh, uh, base at the Maxwell Street Market uh, at Des Plaines and Polk, uh, southwest of the Chicago Loop area. And they found that on January 16th in uh, 09, the air temperature was minus 7 degrees, but the probes that were in the, the base were still all above freezing. Uh, so the blue line, uh, the jaggedy blue line, is the air temperature, um, and just showing you that you know almost the entire uh, way into to uh, uh, February that the base was still above freezing. So if you did get that weird condition where it snows one day and then it melts and the next day it freezes up again, most likely the base will still allow water to infiltrate uh, back into the ground. And actually there's some other studies done. This one was by the uh, Toronto uh, and Regional Conservation Authority up in the uh, 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 Toronto area. Uh, at Seneca College they put in different types of perennial pavement. And they looked at the very similar thing where they had uh, probes in the base. They looked at the temperature of the ground as well as air temperature. The chart on the top shows uh, the red jay line is the, the uh, air temperature, and then the blue is rainfall events, and the, the white is snowfall events. Uh, the dashed line there is uh, freezing at zero degrees Celsius. And what that shows is that, again, the, the base uh, where the air temperature is below freezing for most of the winter there. If you look at the chart on the bottom, the probes are showing that it took about an extra two weeks before the, the ground froze up from the time that uh, the air temperature went below zero until the ground froze up. It was about a two-week period. And even through that winter months where they had snow and even a, a, a rain-type condition, that the water would still infiltrate into the base. And in the report that they put together, you know, that was one of their concerns is that the, the perennial pavement would free, or the base would freeze up and it would inhibit or delay the infiltration when rain occurred after the extended uh, cold spell. Uh, causing the buildup of uh, water in the base. Uh, what they found is that did not occur. It still had, even those minor events, the water would still drain through the, the base material, even in very cold periods. And with the perennial pavement, we also get a lot of questions on, well, can you snow plow uh, pavers? You know, are you going to damage the pavers or rip them out? You can use snow plows across pavers. Uh, especially, you know, where you're using it more for utilitarian uses like parking lot type applications. You can run a steel tip plow across there. It's not going to damage the pavers or rip them out. Uh, this is a parking lot uh, west of the loop where it's uh, called Water Savers is the name of the project. And you can kind of see there the photo towards the uh, middle there's a, where the snow is pushed across horizontally um, and piled up in the corner there. You can kind of see the curl of the snow plow. Uh, it works the same way as it would if this was an asphalt parking lot. You pick up some snow, you, you try to get most of it off. They go back and salt these areas, and eventually the snow will melt and drain away, so eventually it's going to melt off quicker. Uh, we've heard debates on whether or not 
use more salt or less salt. And we've heard different things from different clients. Some say use more because it, it melts and then runs away. Others say use less because when it melts, you don't have to go back out there and lose salt. Uh, so it's hard to say what's, uh, what's true. I think it depends on how um, people do their, their de-icing applications. Uh, and this is showing, this photo here is showing kind of the wear and tear on pavers through after a winter. And this is something you typically see on asphalt or, or poured in place concrete. You can see the rust marks from the steel tip plow. You can also see right in the middle of the screen there where there's a little triangle area on the paver that's kind of worn down. And it's, you know, didn't rip that paver out. It just kind of wore off that high spot from where the, there's kind of a natural crown here, uh, a slight crown, and that's why the, the steel tip blades are wearing a little bit more in those areas. And you kind of see where it just kind of polished that, that stone off. If you had more of a decorative parking lot or uh, an area where it's an entryway and it's perennial pavement, uh, you might want to use a, a fiberglass tip on the plow or a rubber tip plow so you don't leave those rust marks. Uh, it just prevents less damage. But essentially you can see here that you can snow plow those fairly well. And just a couple other photos of snow being pushed across the, the parking lot. And it does clean up fairly well. I, I think this is typically what you would see on a uh, impervious surface as well, but eventually when the sun comes out and this melts the snow on the surface, it drains away. We get a lot of questions about, uh, you know, maintenance solutions, uh, clogging, removal type uh, questions. Uh, there's different things you can do. A lot of uh, owners don't necessarily know that they might already have some of these things in place. So like, for example, you can broom off the permeable surface if you have uh, small areas, you know, entry areas or small plaza areas, you just take a broom, brush it off. If you're doing uh, any kind of landscaping and you spill mulch on the surface, uh, you can always go out there and vacuum up um, sawdust or whatever it might be on the surface of those pavers and try to clean it up initially so it doesn't get packed down into those joints. A lot of uh, maintenance companies that do uh, lawn uh, maintenance have equipment to do stuff like that, like the backpack leaf blowers. So if you're out there and you, you, you trim the hedges or you blow grass clippings onto the pavers, make sure that you blow those uh, off the surface again so they don't get packed down into the, uh, the pavement. Uh, it's important to keep those areas clean. There are some larger type equipment. So uh, some college campuses will use rotary brush uh, sweepers in the wintertime when you get less than an inch of uh, snowfall. Sometimes it's hard to plow uh, some surfaces, so a lot of uh, campuses will use a rotary brush uh, so it doesn't pack that snow down and create an ice on, on the surface. Uh, these things can be used as well to flip out any kind of debris that might get down into those joints and kind of throw that material out of the way. Uh, leaf litter, uh, cigarette butts, things like that, they get packed down in there. And then there's the, the larger industrial sweepers, uh, vacuums, uh, you know, your pelican sweepers that they use along the street, things like that. They can go through and, and sweep up those surfaces or, or vacuum off. Uh, I think one of the other big myths is that you have to vacuum uh, perennial pavement every year. Uh, we kind of follow the preventative maintenance rule where if you do preventative maintenance twice a year or so at least, you know, once in the spring to pick up the, the winter debris as well as leaf, uh, sorry, flowers or, or things like that. And then again in the fall, we'll pick up a leaf litter. If you do those things, you know, a couple times a year, you may not ever need a vacuum. Uh, the Morgan Arboretum has been in for uh, 10 years with perennial pavement in their parking lots. They have a lot of tree, a lot of leaf litter, and they have only done some testing out there, but they've never vacuumed the entire parking lot. Um, if you do have some areas that are clogged because you get soil in there, you could either use power washing to kind of blow out the leaf litter or, or soil, or even compressed air works as well uh, to kind of pop out that material. Uh, sometimes you might push it down in there, so you've got to use the angle of the, the uh, power washer so that it sprays it out instead of forcing it back into the joint. In the worst case scenario, you know, if you're doing a, con uh, a work on a construction site and they don't put down any kind of protection over the perennial pavement, you can always pull that material up clean out the base material and then put down the pavers and, and zip it back up and you'll, you know, essentially you won't have to repay for any uh, new pavement. You can re reinstall those pavers. Uh, this is a video showing a, a rotary sweeper with a vacuum plate. So 
uh, they're just kind of illustrating. You can see the, the the rotation of the the sweeper flips out the uh, joint material in front, and then the vacuum plate will actually pull up uh, about an inch and a half of material out of the joint there. And so, if there's any kind of clogging on the surface from you know whatever it might be, uh, the idea is that you can pull this material out. Uh, you could clean the material uh, and then put it back, or you can just spread new new stone material. I think it depends on what type of uh, system you have out there. And that's one of the beauties of working with pavers versus some of these other systems, the other like uh, bituminous asphalt, porous bituminous asphalt, and porous concrete is you know once that material gets works its way down into the, the you know the pores of that system. They're very, very difficult to clean out. Uh, I've heard that they, they don't clean out hardly at all. Uh, in terms of porous concrete, this is after one winter. Uh, just from snow plowing, you can see all the scrape. They kind of scrape off the surface of that uh, porous concrete and spread that material across the, the sidewalk area there. They come back and try to vacuum some of that stuff up. But again, after one season, that uh, concrete started to come apart. In terms of uh, the systematic solution, uh, components, you know, I think with every project you get to look at the goals, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, we always recommend you look at the site soils because that's really going to impact how you design your system, whether or not you need infrastructure on your drain, uh, things like that. You need to have good uh, soils that drain well. Or if you have very poor soils that don't drain, heavy clays, you're going to need to know that so you can put in the proper on your drain system. Uh, cost can be a factor. Uh, you know, environmental impacts. You want to be at least two feet above any kind of seasonal high water mark. And then every agency, you know, local regulatory departments may differ from uh, you know city to city. So you need to evaluate those and see what's going to work best. Now, conceptually, there's three ways to design the perennial system. The first way would be if you have very poor soil, as your heavy clay is a drain very bad. You want to put some sort of under drain system at the bottom there. To uh, alleviate the water, you know, once the storm passes. Now, this could, where it says lateral outlet, this could tie into a manhole structure that can daylight to a stream. But essentially, you want to put a uh, pipe there to eventually let that water drain out. Uh, if you have better soils, and the rule of thumb we follow is, if you have greater than a half inch an hour of infiltration of the subgraded soils, you can either, you know, raise this uh, pipe up or or put a restrictor plate in the uh, the manhole to kind of back that water up and let some of it, you know, it'd be nice to get that first half inch of water to actually infiltrate back into the ground uh, and cut that down on how much water flows off site uh, so you could raise that pipe up. Well, the third way would be similar like U.S. cellular field where you have very uh, sandy soils but all the water is going to infiltrate. You know, you could uh, eliminate that under drain structure and not tie back in. Uh, for example, U.S. cellular field I mentioned does not actually tie back into the municipal stormwater system. It all drains back into uh, the subgrade. In terms of uh, you know load of the uh, the pavement, you need to make sure that you design the system thick enough so that you can support the traffic or pedestrians or whatever you might have on there. And this kind of spreads out in a cone-shaped fashion. Uh, this is a more than arboretum. They can drive uh, heavy-duty equipment on the surface there. Uh, they have school buses, but you could also drive, you know, semi-tech traffic and things like that on on terminal pavement, depending on how you designed it. Now, the porosity of the the stone base or the void space is about 35 to 40 percent. That's where the water is stored and flows through there. It has a permeability over 500 inches an hour, and the rule of thumb we follow is about two and a half to three inches of the base will store about one inch of water. Uh, we say 24 hours, but you really want that water to get out of there before about 48 hours or 72 hours, depending on the soil conditions, so you don't compromise and have any kind of reflective settlement at the surface. Uh, the different materials that we use in the, the base, uh, I.CA7, I.CA1, again, a base and sub-base, depending on how you do it, and that adds nice structural uh, thickness over the subgrade, has good stable particle interlock. You want to make sure this is all crushed angular stone so it locks together. Rounded stones will want to move around and shift, and that's why you want to use the crushed angular stone. Now, with pavers, you have to have a setting bed. And uh, in traditional non perennial pavement, you use uh, a sand setting bed. With, with uh, perennial pavement, you use a crushed stone. In this case, we use a lot of I.CA16, which is about a, a 3 8 inch stone. Um, and this makes a nice setting bed because you get it nice and smooth. You get a level paving surface. 
but it also chokes down into the TA7 and won't migrate through there. Uh, we put together a chart for different joint materials, and again, depending on the product, I don't get into too many details here, but there's different types of joint material uh, for the different pavers. You can see in the foreground here the CA16 chip and the paver uh, without the joint material, and then once the joint material is filled up there. Uh, and you really want to keep this filled to the lip of the paver. We'll see a settlement of about a, a quarter to a half inch after about three to six months, just from the stone shifting and so settling into place. So you want to come back out and clean that if you need to, or just top it off and keep it filled up there so when you know leaf litter does land on the surface, it doesn't get wedged down in there. And just showing the different materials and how they stack up, the CA-16 on top of the CA-7, a close-up to the CA-7, and the CA-1 there on the lower right-hand corner. In terms of the pavers, um, you know, we're looking at uh, spec sections uh, 34, 32, 14, 13. Uh, the main difference between permeable and non-permeable uh, specs is that in the permeable, there's no sand sediment. Again, it's all open grade crushed stone, uh, no sand. Uh, we look at ASTM C936 for our manufacturing standard, and it really kind of compares three things. Uh, the C140 is the absorption and compressive strength. The minimum uh, PSI is about 7,200 per unit with about a 5% average. Uh, we actually make ours a little bit higher than that. 8,500 is our minimum with about a 4% average. Uh, some of our products will average well over 12,000 PSI. Uh, so if you do the math on that, you're looking at you know over um, almost a million pounds per square foot uh, on some of those. Uh, in terms of uh, comparison, average country, you know, ranges from 2,700 to 5,500 after their uh, uh, breaks at uh, the 28-day breaks. Uh, forest country is a little bit less than that; it doesn't have quite the strength. So, if you use those in dry areas, it may uh, start to come apart. Uh, this slide is just showing different uh, examples of what products are out there and the ones that we make. Uh, Eco Optilock again. This is manufactured by uh, different companies, but this has a half-inch wide joint, allows that 200 inches per hour of infiltration. Uh, we do have, um, we look at it across the field, it shows, uh, it looks like a cobble surface, but when you look at it up close, you can see the, the joint material. Uh, the nice thing about these are they're L-shaped, so it prevents that twisting and turning motion, really locks together. Uh, just some examples of some, some projects. Uh, this is out in Charles City, Iowa, 19 blocks of pavers downtown. Uh, EcoPriora is the one that was used at Buckingham. That's been used in different uh, pedestrian spaces. It's nice because it has a nice tight joint area. Uh, up at Ravinia, north side of uh, the city of Chicago, and a couple of their parking lots, save about 100,000 square feet. Again, half-inch wide joint. This is laid in a hand-blown pattern. Uh, there's new products that look like, uh, you know, running running the boardwalk type pavement. Uh, this is at a plant uh, in Ohio where they actually drive uh, loading uh, semi-trucks across it. Uh, Navy Pier has some uh, perennial pavement going in this year uh, in this 3 by 12 shape with a half inch wide or quarter inch wide joint and there's more decorative. So there's a lot of different types of pavers out there for perennial pavement and you just kind of have to pick which one's going to work best for your application. And, and actually uh, be structural. So with uh, a couple of them, you want to look at the bottom and see how they interlock. You want to have good positive interlocks so they don't shift or move around. Uh, this statement's uh, a little bit more decorative, but could be driven on. Uh, we do make uh, some face mix products, and this cuts down on the wear and tear so you don't see any kind of fading over time. Uh, you know, over a, a 10 or a 15 year period, it still should look the same, you know, and, as it does when it's first put in. Life cycles on pavers are a good uh, 30 to 50 years, uh, so they can last a long time and, and still look colorful and not faded if you use a uh, face mix type product. Uh, this one's showing a brush pavement versus the, the smooth pavement in the background there. So again, you can do some pretty interesting looking designs with uh, perennial pavement. Uh, this is one color that has a coating on the surface that prevents staining. Uh, so there's a lot of different options for uh, pavers. Um, and, you know, these can be put on all the different shapes uh, that are available for, um, you know, parking lots and, and pedestrian space. And that's really one of the cool things about pavers is that we can make them in 
several different colors and textures, uh, so you're not just stuck with gray concrete or black asphalt. You do have the flexibility to do these in colors that aren't going to fade over time. So you put it all together, this is kind of what the, the system might look like. Uh, you do have to have an edge restraint to kind of contain that. Uh, these are the different layers and components. You may have under drain, you may have some geotextile there. Depends on the system that you have. This can kind of shows you what that might look like. In more of a section type view, you can see the layering. There's no geotextiles needed between the layers. You only need geotextile to wrap around the under drain. And if you have sandy soils, you want to put down an under drain type system there. Uh, in the last couple slides here, we're kind of getting short on time. Uh, I want to show you the mechanical installation device. This is in, uh, a project that was installed out at uh, Morton Arboretum, and they're actually picking up about 11 square feet, and they're going to lay this uh, in place. These are all individual stones, but the way that the shape is configured, the L shape, or the way that it's uh, laid in the pattern, uh, they lock together. It only clamps on two sides. So in this one minute clip, they're going to lay 22 square feet. If you do the math, it works out to about eight to 10,000 square feet per day per machine that they can install these, and they're driving on it right away. So as soon as they tap these into place, or run a, a, a compactor over there to kind of even off the surface and sweep the joints in, you can phase in parking and have people driving on this the next day if you need to. And that's really one of the beauties of uh, the parental pavement system is you, you're ready to go once they're installed. And they're, they're functional as a, a stormwater system. Um, that's all I have. Uh, I do have a quick commercial about Unilock, but uh, since we're short on time, I don't want to keep you. I want to answer some questions first. So if anyone has any questions now. Any questions? All right. Thanks, Brad. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. The okay. first one is, hang on one second. The first one is, is efflorescence a concern with pavers? And if so, how can it be avoided? Um, you know, back you know, 10, 15 years ago when we first started making pavers, we had a little bit more efflorescence. Uh, we've added more admixtures into our mix design, so you tend to have less than that. It's a little bit different than it is with clay. So with concrete pavers, it's really the efflorescence you see on the surface is from um, unhydrated cement. So uh, occasionally we'll have a little bit, but once you uh, wash that off, you can use uh, like a power washer or you can even use, just let it weather naturally. Once that cement is hydrated, efflorescence won't continue. With clay type materials, uh, efflorescence can continue from year to year to year. Uh, for the lifetime of the product. So we don't have that with papers, especially with the admixtures we use. Um, we've got a couple more questions coming in. The next one, any sure. issues regarding utility structures within the pavement, for example, MH frames, valve boxes, et cetera? Well, you have to have uh, you know the right amount of cover for any kind of utilities in there. So if you had, for example, uh, I know another storm type system or a pipe, you want to have enough cover over it. Um, I would assume that with water lines, you uh, you probably want to not have those directly underneath the perennial pavement. I have not heard any uh, direct feedback on that, but uh, you know that would be my gut that you want to move those. But in terms of anything else, it works the same way as it would with other type systems. Okay. Next question, what is the minimum thickness of bedding that can be utilized for parking lots? Uh, bedding or base material? It says bedding. Bedding, typically we like to have about an inch and a half of the setting bed material, the CA-16 material. And that's because, you know, a lot of times when we put down the CA-7, it's hard to get it completely flat. So it might range from, you know, it might vary a half inch to an inch. So if you put down an inch and a half, you're getting a good uh, a level surface for that. You won't have too much reflective uh, uh, you know, surface uh, if there's any deflection. Okay. Uh, the next question, what is the recommended me method of finish grading setting the bed prior to paper placement? Uh, can you repeat that again? Yeah, uh, what is the recommended method uh, 
to finish grading the setting bed prior to pave or placement? Hmm. Well, there's a couple different ways. Um, you can do it kind of manually by putting some uh, speed rails down that are an inch and a half thick o over the top of the subgrade or the, uh, the base area and pouring out a pile of uh, stone and using a, almost like a two by four or a speed rail and pulling that across the speed rails and that will get you a nice inch and a half uh, leveling surface. There are also um, special machines that can put it down. Now we've seen asphalt spreaders used to put down an inch and a half to two inches of of the CA16 uh, setting bed, uh, but there's also a specialty machine that can that's designed just for sand and stone that uh, uses laser guided uh, uh, methods to uh, screen off that to the proper height. So it just depends. And typically, we like to see that you know not the setting bed not be more than about two inches. If you start to get more than that, you might have uh, some running on the surface if you're using uh, wheel vehicles. If it's just for pedestrian spaces, you know, ideally you still want to be around that two inches, but you could be a little bit more. Okay. Um, we've got two more questions. The first sure. is uh, a request for your contact information. Okay. Um, um, and then the second is, do you make a coal black paper which would melt snow faster? <laughs> we do make a... Uh, uh, we can make a, a dark charcoal. We do have a color called onyx black, which uh, was used down at the Shad Aquarium. I'm sorry, the uh, Museum of Science and Industry this year for crosswalk areas. So the, the pavement field was gray, and then the crosswalk areas were this black onyx black, and it, it did actually melt out faster on the black material. Uh, in terms of my contact information, you know, I, I can provide that uh, or. If you would provide that to people, uh, you can contact me at Unilock or brad.swanson at unilock.com. And, and we're happy to come in and do a lunch and learn for your office as well if you're interested in having us uh, show this presentation again. All right. Well, those are all of the questions. And thank you again so much for um, presenting again for us today, Brad. Um, and My pleasure. Just a reminder to everyone to please complete the quiz by Sunday. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact me at Courtney Adams at IllinoisEngineer.com. Have a great day, everybody, and thanks so much. Thank you.